Welcome back to Archaeology After Dark, everyone. This is take two because we uh, had a slight language issue from both of us in the original. <laughs> My guest today is Maria Slitterud. Still not quite right, is it? No, um, but I don't mind. It's okay. <laughs> I can I can try and say it instead. Oh, I can say it. I can, no, that's um, okay. <laughs> well, um, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself since I'm so bad at it. You're not bad at it. It's uh, it's Danish or like Norwegian Danish, so it's okay to not be able to pronounce it in my opinion. So I'm Maria Slidable, Um and I'm from Denmark, and I have a bachelor's degree in Near Eastern Archaeology. Um, and I am currently writing my master's thesis in the same subject. And uh, on the side, I'm working um, as a field archaeologist um, with the museum West Zealand, or West Zealand, sorry, um, like three days a week as a field archaeologist. And I'm also a co-editor of the student journal Chronolog at the University of Copenhagen. And I also worked in Germany for a year because I was stressed, so I quit my thesis, <laughs> and I moved to Germany for a year, basically. I mean, I have met numerous people who are like, well, I hate my thesis, and I'm going to take a break. Yep, yeah. like, why not? And I was able to get back to, like, I just applied again, and they were like, yeah, sure, because the university, they get money when you graduate, so they want you to graduate. So um, I guess... Uh, I'm worth it. <laughs> I mean, we try to look as good as possible when people ask us real questions. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah, you know, usually the question you get is, hey, how are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm doing okay. <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's so funny because I hear this, like, in the U.S., it's normal to, like, just say, hey, how are you? And it's like, I'm good. And then you continue on. But like in Denmark, that's like you just say hi. You never ask like in like if I go into a shop and stuff like this, because it's it's like, do you really mean it, or do you just want me to be polite and say I'm good, or like do you want my life story about how much this part sucks, or like you know? <laughs> so <laughs> like hi, I'm falling apart a little bit, but how are you? <laughs> Exactly. Like, I'm just super stressed right now. It's fine. It's fine. How are you? <laughs> but again, people who are watching this, all these things come along with the job of being an archaeologist is you're constantly questioning everything you do and smiling while you do it. Exactly. And at the same time, also, <clears throat> I don't know how it is in the U.S., but I could imagine it's a bit of the same that, um, or at least in, in Denmark and many other places it's like contract work so you have like a contract for, for example mine is 10 months and then maybe they will extend it maybe not so you're always like do i have a job do i not have a job so that's stressful and you still just smile and not long and you're just happy you have a job for now <laughs> yeah that's that's exactly how it is here uh, a lot of the work especially here in alabama is done through mm -hmm. you know one of a handful of government agencies and yeah. the contract goes for like a year, a year and a half or two. And then you're like, well, project's over. What do I do now? Exactly. It's, it's uh, if you want like stability and stuff like that, archaeology is probably not the best route. Um, and like, you have to just be prepared to, like, I, I went to Germany for four months and worked, went back to Denmark to see if I could get a job and I couldn't. So I went back to Germany because there was a job and I feel like you just have to be okay with that, especially because I only had a bachelor's degree. So I was like, it's a bit more difficult to get a job. And so it's just like, I get the experience from going to a different country and just work there. And, but you have to be flexible, I think. <laughs> yeah. So for those of you who are interested in becoming an archeologist, Flexibility is key both mentally and physically because you will be doing a lot of manual labor. Yeah. Yeah. I started 
like gaining muscle like in my arms and stuff when I started archaeology in Germany because I've always been super weak like my arms are just like there's no muscle so that's a good thing like you get exercise um in that sense but you also have to watch out for like your back and knees especially I think yeah I was on a, a survey right before COVID and when that survey was over, I laid on the floor for a week and my dog was nice enough to come and lick me in the face and make sure I wasn't oh. dead. <laughs> He's like, you Can doing you... okay, bud? I'm like, no, no, I'm not. But thank not you. at all, not at all. <laughs> oh my God, yeah, that sound, sounds really hard. I, yeah, like in the beginning, I just remember like my back hurting, my arms hurting, my legs hurting, everything was just hurting for like the first two weeks or something in Germany. But then, like, it gets better. And, yeah, I had, like, one day here in Denmark where my, um, like, the site supervisor, he was at the dentist. So it was just me and the guy who drives the excavator. And so, like, the supervisor just been like, okay, we need to clear this area because there's been a survey. And then the contractor, he didn't want to cover up the area that had been surveyed and was supposed to be excavated. So it just been like an open area for like six months. So there was just like thistles and algae, like so the ground was just green somewhere. And my supervisor was like, okay, you can clear this area. <clears throat> and it's quite a big area. So I just had to like, you know, remove dirt or like soil and then go with the wheelbarrow. And after doing that, like taking the wheelbarrow like back and forth 30 times, he came to the site started doing the same as me and then he was like I don't think this is a good idea maybe we could just ask the excavator to take this off and I was like thank you and my legs were hurting so much because I'd just been lifting so much so sometimes it still gets back to me like the how difficult the labor can be yeah and then we you know, we work for museums and we have educational programs where we show kids what we actually do. And then we, on occasion, let them do it. And there are some kids who are like, oh, I hate this. And they've been digging for all of like 10 minutes. And then there are the kids that are really into it. And they're like, can I get back in the dirt? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yes, please get back in the dirt. Yes. Yes. Go back. Yeah. Yes. I by all means, make, make my job easier. <laughs> exactly i don't have much experience with kids in archaeology i have to admit um but yeah i could i could imagine it's very different how they like it um how they receive it well the thing is there are a lot of people who grow up in like cities and things and they don't have a lot of like nature experience and then they're like first time archaeologists and they're like oh something touched me yeah <laughs> touch me oh god yeah and then we'll just be like out on a site here in Alabama and some wild animal will just come like walking through the site and we're like huh that's neat <laughs> I do it in, in Germany we um, were excavating um, an area right next to like a farm where they had a lot of horses and stuff and apparently um, people like used to go rabbit hunting in the area where we worked. So like one day I was just going to like to the loo and I hear like this loud bang and I'm like, what was that? And then I go and I go back and like my supervisor calls me and he's like, yeah, you need to put your like the, the yellow jacket back on because um, there's some hunters here trying to hunt rabbits and they just shot like towards us and I was like what the fuck so the landowner hadn't told them I was like this is a big archaeological site like you can see there's an excavator you can see there's people walking around and they just wanted to hunt rabbits I was like are you kidding me like <laughs> so that's the wild animal hunters and rabbits oh uh, we have hunters but they don't they're not really specific about what they shoot here hmm. It's really yeah. bad. I guess you have like a very different kind of wildlife than they do in northern Germany. There's like a few wolves and deer and foxes and stuff like that. I don't think we have wolves, but we have everything else. <laughs> I mean, I've never seen one. 
I did have a friend. He was on a survey in South Carolina, and they were being stalked by a bobcat most of the day. I thought that was uh, okay. No, Denmark is very. Uh, we don't really have any dangerous animals. We have two snakes. None of them are really dangerous. And then we have like a snail, which is called the killer snail, but it's because it like poisons your crops and stuff like this, and like your garden. So it's not poisonous to humans, just to plants. So we call it a killer snail, and that's the worst thing we have, I guess. Wow. <laughs> we have. So you guys don't have snakes in Germany and Denmark, do you? Uh, we have two snakes in Denmark, and none of them are dangerous. Um, so we have like I don't know what the names are in English, and I think it's the same in northern Germany. I can't speak for like the south. That's like very different, but I don't think they have any. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't want to say anything about Germany too much. I know about Denmark. We have two snakes and they're not dangerous. We have all the dangerous snakes here. <laughs> I guess like Denmark is very peaceful in that sense. There's We have a few wolves, um, some places, but, you know, very few. And then, yeah, the snakes. So it's very peaceful and yeah. There's not really anything to be afraid of in that sense. It sounds really nice with your non-snake surveys. <laughs> Two snakes chilling, not doing any harm to anyone, only the things they eat. Yeah. We were we were taking a site tour. I was in a, a class a couple of years ago and we had a snake just come like slithering in front of our school group and one student tried to run up a tree to get away from it. I love that. I would love to see that, like just trying to crawl the way up. <laughs> yeah. So the types of artifacts you run into in Denmark, what, um, what is the normal to, I guess, see on a survey? Um, so we have post holes. So, you know, um, from occupation, that's what you mainly find. Um, that's the normal thing to find is post holes. Um, I've only worked in Denmark since September, but it's kind of the same deal you have in Germany, that you have a lot of post holes. So it's like occupational. Um, sometimes you have um, what is it called? I don't know the English words, but like areas where you have maybe a lot of trash, like a lot of like animal bones, for example, um, which is really nice, like big deposits um, of stuff like that, which is nice because then you can like kind of see what they ate. Um, and sometimes in the post holes, uh, my one of my first days here in Denmark, I found. Um, this um, we call it like directly translate like an offering bowl um, so which they put inside the post holes in a house for example it's not in every house but in some houses they put like an um, offering bowl when they build the house so that was quite nice like another one was found just before I started it was like really small and really crooked and weird so we're like this is a child who made it uh, yeah, it uh, must be. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's, and we excavate from Neolithic. So, of course, you have a lot of, like, stone tools sometimes. Iron Age, Bronze Age. Sometimes, like, there's Viking Age stuff, um, but it's not, like, the most common. And then you have, uh, of course, Medieval. So it's kind of different what you find, right? Um, but I've been mainly working... Iron Age here in Denmark, I think. Yeah, that's something that always, you know, I guess, kind of weirds me out about archaeology is how much difference there is in archaeology just because two continents are separated by an ocean. Like, we didn't have, like, the Bronze Age or the Iron Age here. Like, no. like those things, like, those events still happen, but we didn't have the technology of those time periods here. No. That's yeah, that's quite interesting. Um, I because I also uh, have worked quite a bit, like like a few times, been to um, 
like the Middle East area. Um, so so that's also fun to see how the Iron Age is. Like I was just in Kurdish region in in um, in Iraq, and like the Iron Age there is so different from the Danish one, of course, because you have like full occupations with like really big houses and the stone walls are still there and like you know everything is still in place basically and so it's very different also in that sense um what you find in different um countries yeah like we don't see like stone architecture like standing stone architecture until the first europeans arrived here in yeah. the late oh, yeah. 1400s early 1500s wow yeah that's, but uh, it's still here, and it's borderline nice to look at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm judging somebody's architecture, but, you know, I look at a stone wall, and I'm like, wow, that is tacky. <laughs> <laughs> stone wall is tacky, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's tacky because it sticks together. That's funny. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> uh. so um, what are your goals for the future? I mean, assuming aside from finishing your thesis. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Sorry, I'm asking a real question. Now. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <clears throat> Um, first of all, get rid of this cough. It's really <laughs> annoying. <laughs> I promise this is just tea I'm drinking a lot of because uh, really trying to get away. Um, no, but so yeah, handing in my thesis, obviously, so I can finish my master's degree and get a higher salary mm -hmm. would be nice. Um, and then like I have a contract here in Denmark until the end of June. And I don't know if they will extend it or if I want to stay even um, because I have this idea that I want to move to a different country and then another country. And, you know, it's <laughs> so I kind of, um, yeah, I never really know where I want to be. Um, right now, I'm happy to be here because I've missed living in Denmark while I was in Germany um because yeah i'm from copenhagen and i really love copenhagen um so it's nice to be back and um yeah but i'm going like to turkey in september i think and hopefully i'm going to jordan in november i was supposed to go november 2023 but, but with the whole conflict war um it wasn't that safe to go so um right now i'm just focusing on what's happening right now and maybe i will move to a different country at some point this year next year well i'm considering the... moving to, to norway actually next year because they have short field seasons but higher salary and i'm half norwegian so i'm actually a norwegian citizen so it could be nice to try and live there i'm there two times a year already and would be nice to try and live in that country. It's very beautiful. So maybe that's what I'll do in 2025. But who knows? Well, that's the, one of the best things about archaeology is you actually can do it anywhere. Yeah. I mean, with, exactly. you know, with the permissions and, you know, the people not shooting at you when you go places, that would be great, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was also because it was just in Scotland on like uh, at a conference. And I just fell in love with Scotland. So I was like, maybe I should just move here. Like that's happened every time I go somewhere. I always think maybe I should just move here. So that's also why I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> maybe I'll just go somewhere. Yeah, I had that same dilemma. Uh, this was a couple of years before COVID. I went on a field trip with some people to Ireland and... Mm. It was, you know, the winding down the last couple of days of the trip. And I was like, would anyone notice if I didn't get on the plane home and yeah. I just kind of like stayed here? Exactly. <laughs> I have that feeling all the time when I go somewhere new and I feel at home very fast. Uh, just need to know where there's a good place to have coffee. And then like when I moved to Germany, I moved and I was like, 
I just need to buy a plant or two, have some books. I'm settled. Like that's all I need. And I don't need, even need to have lots of friends or anything. It's just, you know, get comfortable. And yeah, so, so yeah, I always have all of these daydreaming. Uh, where should I go next? Yeah, all, all, all I need to function as an archaeologist is a place to get coffee in the morning and an alcoholic beverage at night, and I can work anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, the upside of Denmark. There's always alcohol available. So so I need to plan a trip to Denmark at some point in the future. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's probably like Denmark is a bit expensive, but I would say like we have uh, it's easy to get alcohol. You can just go to the supermarket and get anything. Or gas station or and like the drinking age is also really low here it's like 16 i think yeah 16 16 you can buy beer and wine 18 you can buy spirits and go to bars yeah really like denmark <laughs> <laughs> but there's the issue of then a lot of young people drinking and starting really early because it's easy to get by so that's kind of an issue we have here I think we're one of the countries where children start drinking the earliest, so that's not great <laughs> either. No. So yeah. Yeah, I can uh, see the problem. I can see the problem with that. Yeah. I think it's like we like Denmark is rainy, stormy, cold, dark a lot of the year. So people really need coffee and alcohol. We're also one of the countries that drinks the most coffee. So like you need the alcohol and the coffee and and you're good to go. And we're not social creatures either. Like you have friends that you made in first grade, and then those are the friends you have the rest of your life. And so you need the alcohol to uh, to get to know Danish people. So, so aside from uh, finding a nice coffee place and a place to buy alcohol, um, if someone wanted to get started as an archaeologist, what advice would you give them? Um, so like get started as in doing the, like a degree, um, in or archaeology. just get involved in general. Okay. So I think <clears throat> for me, because I have degree, I would probably, and also because I, I have a journal. So I think this is really important, especially for people who want to go into academia that you learn about, um, publishing, like how important it is if you want to be in academia to get published. So, because in like during my bachelor's and master's, we've maybe had like one or two hours where a professor talked about this and that was it. And then I would also say, get a driver's license. That's really important. I don't have one. <laughs> it's really annoying. <laughs> uh, I've been trying like for a few years to get myself together to finish it, the driver's license. And yeah, I think you just need to be like really aware that like how, like how the job market is. You just need to know that it's not always gonna be easy and you might have to do other jobs in between to get by and that there's not always stability and um, then I think like if you're just getting started, try to see if there's any excavations where you can volunteer, like field schools of some sort, to get a feeling of it. Um, yeah, and drink lots of coffee. Yeah, you're gonna need coffee or caffeine of some kind to get through this as a profession. It's it's not yeah. a suggestion, it's a requirement really. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like I know people who started drinking coffee during the degree because they just needed <laughs> the caffeine. So yeah, it's definitely necessary to drink or get caffeine in some way. Well, that is going to do it uh, for us here today at Archaeology After Dark. Maria, thank you so much for being here. I have really enjoyed having you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really nice. All right, everybody. Take care.